Today, there is widespread concern about the growing role of robots in our lives, in particular about the potential for robots to take our jobs. The vision of my work is to be intentional about creating computing that augments rather than merely replaces people. This is about developing intelligence for collaboration so that the systems lift us up to make us better and make us stronger. Now, many of us uh, might not be aware, there are actually many, many robots around us every day, but they're relatively simple and so they're not at the front of our minds. I've spent uh, much of my career working in robotics for manufacturing, deploying robots that work alongside people to help build planes and build cars. And today, there are 1.8 million robots in operation in factories around the world. So that's the same number as the human population of New York, San Francisco, and Pittsburgh combined. And these robots, up until recently, worked relatively separate from people, in separate physical spaces doing separate work. And that resulted in an either-or choice if we had a task, either a person did it or a robot did it. And that either-or choice was highly inefficient and in some cases downright unsafe. And so when I started at the faculty at MIT, I devoted my whole efforts into developing artificial intelligence that allows humans and machines to work together more effectively, to be able to address the challenges I observed out on the assembly lines at Boeing, BMW, and elsewhere. I forged partnerships with aerospace and automotive companies with DOD research labs to develop robots that could learn from us and learn with us to enhance us rather than replace us. My lab and I now are taking a step out of the factories to be able to bring this type of partnership um, to our everyday lives across society. And today, there are actually 30 million robots in US homes. Uh, and these are the things we just actually visually recognize as robots, so Roombas. Um, that's not counting the Siri's, the Alexa's. Many smart homes have sensors, they're turning on our data, they're making changes in our environment. Those are a type of robots. We rapidly have delivery robots being deployed on our sidewalks, delivering our food. We have security robots patrolling apartment complexes. And as of this spring, this really strange googly-eyed robot is being rolled out uh, across 500 grocery stores across the country, and its task is to go up and down aisles and look for hazards like spills. Now, these robots are still relatively simple, uh, and they're not intelligent enough to collaborate with us, which is why we're not yet fully realizing their potential to, uh, to make us um, as good as we can be. Um, Furthermore, these robots are being deployed in ways that are not uh, equitable. Uh, different people have different access to this technology, and this technology impacts different people differently. Um, now, this is really not such a big problem when it's a Roomba quietly in your living room, when it's one Roomba, but it becomes a really big problem when these systems are deployed out in our world all around us at scale. And this is not some future sci-fi concept. This is a headline from a year and a half ago. About a year and a half ago, there were so many sidewalk delivery robots deployed out on the sidewalks of San Francisco that there was a revolt. Um, the, the elderly, it, you know, the elderly and, and people with disabilities came together and said, we feel unsafe on these sidewalks. These are systems that don't understand our needs. Um, and and, and, and uh, we just don't want to be in the same you know, space as them. And as a result, San Francisco actually banned these robots from the most populous areas of the city. Okay, so this is the canary in the coal mine. This is the beginning um, of a future in which these systems are all around us, and this is our moment to understand the opportunity to design these systems to integrate better in our society, and that's the way we'll be able to achieve the maximum benefit um, of, these, um, of these robots, of these intelligent machines. Now, um, you know, a key learning from my research is that these systems do have the potential, tremendous potential, to enhance our economic productivity and our quality of life, but the current state um, doesn't realize this vision, and it's in large part because we lack a coherent intellectual framework for the creation, design, test, and deployment of these systems uh, to work around and among humans. Now, um, as you know, Boston, um, MIT is in Boston, which is in New England. 
Um, and I'm about to tell you a little bit about the work from my lab uh, towards developing a science uh, of making robots into better teammates. So here's our obligatory picture of Tom Brady. Um, <laughs> We draw from cognitive science and psychology to reverse engineer what it is that makes humans such outstanding teammates. And, you know, so a part of that is asking, well, why does Tom Brady win so much? Um, and those, uh, those you might say, some might say that it's uh, because of cheating. Um, okay, but so we in, we in New England know it's actually because he's an outstanding team leader. And, um, you know, they say he sees and he knows. And that's actually the foundation of effective human teamwork. It's knowing what your partner is thinking, anticipating what they're going to do next, and then making fast adjustments when things don't go according to plan. And that's what we work on um, developing the intelligence for, the collaborative intelligence for machines to work with us as true team members and partners. We work on this to embed intelligent machines and robots into the planning when we come together in the huddle to, to, to uh, discuss our game plan, to uh, enable them to be able to learn by watching us and sort of jump in and actually training and practice, practicing with us, and then being able to go out on the field and actually play the game with us. Um, now, the trick is that in the real world, we often don't know the rules of the game, uh, and at any moment in time, it's actually not clear whether we're winning or losing. And that sets up some fundamental uh, challenges for these intelligent systems to learn to work with us. And the key is to ensure that we develop intelligent machines that do two things. One is, across all these spaces of teamwork, they need to be able to reduce our cognitive burden, and they need to be able to communicate with us. Now, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a project that um, my lab worked on a few years ago um, with Beth Israel Medical Deaconess uh, Hospital in Boston. I'm an aerospace engineer, I'm a roboticist, and now I'm telling you about a project in a hospital. And the reason is that the woman that you see in this picture here uh, is actually an air traffic controller. So she monitors all of those LCD screens, takes all that information in. She, she takes the information in from that handwritten whiteboard, which includes uh, information about the current state of the labor and delivery floor, the progress of each patient through labor. Uh, and she makes a number of decisions. For example, which patients go to which rooms, which nurses are assigned to which patients, um, decisions around the operating room schedule, and many others. Um, now, I, I took on this project with great, great interest because I have a two-and-a-half-year-old and an eight-month-old. And when we took on this project, I was, uh, it was about the time I got pregnant with my first um, child. And um, so, here's an interesting fact. Um, uh, the, the Joint Commission observed that 80 to 90 percent of sentinel events, which are medical errors that result in death or near death, occur due to human factors. And those include issues of cognitive burden, uh, and failures in communication and teamwork. So, this woman does a job that is computationally more complex than that of an air traffic controller today, and she does it without any decision support. So our challenge was to be able to develop intelligent machine teammates that could learn from a day in the life, learn through apprenticeship, the way a nurse apprentices a more senior nurse or a medical student apprentices a doctor. We draw from cognitive science to design structured machine learning models that are able to efficiently piece together the information they observe about how these nurse managers do their job, and then are able to jump in and offer suggestions uh, for what actions to take and what to do next. So I'm going to show you a video of our robot deployed uh, in the live hospital. Uh, now, it's, now the robot, uh, it's not about the physical robot, it's about sort of the, the cognitive processing of this robot. It's reading that handwritten whiteboard and it's making suggestions to the nurses and doctors uh, regarding uh, what should happen next on the floor. What is a good decision? Right, like, and it kind of made me like, mm -hmm. And so this is all of the information she, the nurse manager takes in to make her decisions. We train the system through a simulation environment in which nurses play a day in the life of their job. What is a good decision? I recommend placing new patients in triage band number five. What is the bad decision? A bad decision would be to place a scheduled cesarean section patient in room 14 and have nurse Kristen take care of her. Ginger, what's a good decision? I recommend placing a scheduled section patient in room 14 and have nurse take care of her. I don't know if you plan to go back or what, but for me it was like this the one thing. I always plan to go back. Ginger, what's a bad decision? We are not. A bad decision would be to place a scheduled cesarean section 
I agree. <laughs> And in our, in our controlled experiments, we found that nurses and doctors agreed with the suggestions of our system 90% of the time. And this is very exciting, because a system like this will never be able to fully deal with the ambiguity and uncertainty of these very complex real-world situations. But a system that can take the, even the simple decisions off the plate of these nurses and doctors can free up their cognitive capacity for them to focus more effort on the most challenging situations to be able to make um, healthcare safer for us all. So this is an example of how a robot can reduce our cognitive burden, um, but other, many other issues are equally uh, often rooted in failures of communication and teamwork. And this transcends industries. So uh, from healthcare to aviation, I'm showing you a picture here of two pilots in the cockpit of a simulator. And while you do train in the simulator to be able to learn how to fly the plane, Actually, equal emphasis is placed on pilots learning how to and practice communicating with each other. Um, a study observed that 74% of aviation, commercial aviation incidents occurred when pilot co-pilot crews were flying together for the first time on their first day. So this is something that is very, very challenging for people to get right, to learn how to communicate effectively together. When we're going to be communicating and collaborating with these robots, we are not going to have hundreds of hours of practice and experience. So the opportunity here is to develop intelligence for collaboration, to make these systems smart enough to be able to communicate with us and shore up our weaknesses. We've conducted many studies over the years in our lab. We bring unsuspecting MIT students and people from the greater Boston area into the lab to work with our robots. Uh, and often we have them do simple tasks, like build up building blocks on a table, fetch the right materials. Um, and it turns out that working with robots is really, really annoying. You have to tell them very explicitly, step by step, what to do, and they ask a lot of very explicit questions. Um, we develop intelligent robot partners and intelligent machine teammates that are able to learn what the human partner is thinking, anticipate what they're going to do next, and be able to provide either the right physical materials or, equally important, the right information at just the right time. And what we find is that when we bring people into the lab to work with these intelligent machine partners that exhibit these qualities of the best human teams, it actually lifts up the performance of the human team, even though they haven't had substantial prior experience training and working together. So this is very exciting, and it shines a light forward of how we can develop collaborative machine intelligence to make us all better. Now, the challenge is that we have to intentionally invest in technology development that collaborates with people. This is not about developing AI that performs particular tasks that people do today or even that people do better. This is a separate type of intelligence we need to invest in if we're going to get the most that we can out of this technology. Um, we're developing breakthroughs and driving this forward, specifically designing these systems with human factors in mind and through consideration of the social implications of the technology. Now, to do this well, it requires reverse engineering effective, uh, the minds of our effective team partners here, drawing in expertise from across disciplines. It requires developing new intellectual frameworks uh, for us to drive the breakthroughs um, that are going to translate across disciplines. This is not a problem that uh, is specific to healthcare or to aviation. It's an issue that affects um, uh, all industries across all sectors of the economy. And it involves training a new generation of engineers to be able to analyze and articulate the social and ethical considerations and design specifically for the human factors. Um, I think if we do this right, we can create a future together where we don't have robots that replace us. We have robots that are able to harness the relative strengths of people and robots to accomplish what neither of us can do alone. Thank you. <laughs>